Hey, everybody, we're ready to start. Thanks so much for joining us here at George Memory Net Insights or GN Insights. Uh, we are uh, going to have a great discussion today about the guide program. I always have to look this up. It is Guiding an Improved Dementia Experience Model. It's the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services Investment. And hey, look, we've got to do something a little bit different in primary care in order to meet the needs of folks who are living with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. We are certainly fortunate to have Dr. Gabriella Cohen on today to lead us in our discussion. Not only is she the course director for this program, but she's an assistant professor, soon to be associate professor in the mm -hmm. Department of Medicine in the Division of Geriatrics and Gerontology. If you uh, look Dr. Cohen up, it says experienced and compassionate on the website, and both of those are true. Really appreciate getting a chance to work with Dr. Cohen. She um, does great work at the Grady Memory Assessment Clinic, one of Georgia Memory Net's uh, seven clinics across the state. And she is also the lead for the Grady-based guide program and was just interviewed by Leadership and CMS just last week. And so looking forward to a conversation with her. I want to point out that there are seven guide demonstration projects in Georgia and several of you are leading these programs across the state, and we're really looking forward to getting us together to support each other and help each other. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Cohen. Thanks so much for, for doing this session. Really looking forward to your uh, talk today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ted. And thank you uh, for inviting me. Well, I'm part of this course, too, so it's a, always a pleasure to, to give a lecture. Um, I think this is a... These are great news and these are great times. And I think we should all work together in uh, setting up these programs in all these uh, different uh, programs over the state of Georgia. So I will give a little bit of um, why I thought it was important to have guide at Grady. And then I will present like a simulation of a patient and then maybe open the discussion to all of us to see how we could personalize each of these guide programs based on what the patients needs in different parts of the state of Georgia. So this is kind of my objectives. Uh, talk a little bit about guide, uh, see some different clinical scenarios. And uh, as I said before, uh, of course, this guide program is really focused on improving the experience for both the patients and the caregivers, talking a lot about caregiver education and caregiver resources, and I have no conflicts of interest. So the, um, the aspect of what I'm really interested in is dementia, uh, older adults living with dementia and also comorbidity. So this approach of having many diseases as is very common here to see at the Charity Clinic Grady, usually leads to fragmented care with multiple providers, with polypharmacy and bad outcomes. And sometimes the, one of the diseases with dementia and we treat dementia with one therapy, and the therapy for that condition could lead to a different adverse effect and a different uh, disease. And that really adds up to polypharmacy. And we call this the geriatric cascade. So all these patients who have not just dementia, but dementia and all the other comorbid diseases. And this is the situation that I encounter at Grady when I start doing my research on dementia. And I saw that many of the patients are very, very complex with many other diseases besides dementia. So when we have all this situation, what do we do? Do we treat dementia? And do we treat all these different diseases separately? Or do we try to come with a plan that includes all these other diseases and this complexity? And this is interesting because dementia comorbidity is not just happened here at Grady, but it happens in very, very different settings. This is just a, a report of dementia and comorbidity in Spain. And it was a large sample. And what they saw is that most patients have at least three other comorbid conditions besides dementia. And hypertension and diabetes were the most common other conditions besides dementia. Um, and we could, when we have these uh, complex patients with many diseases, we could follow the traditional approach with usually different providers. And sometimes when patients have many diseases, this could lead to pragmatic care, as I said before, and polypharmacy. And usually in this traditional approach with many different providers, it's hard to acknowledge and to align the plan of care with the patient's preferences. 
So we are trying to move into this more goal-directed um, approach that definitely increase patients and caregiver satisfaction, improve quality, reduces costs. And this is one of the main principles published in by the American Chiretic Association in 2010. So sometimes it's recommending this patient-centered care. And a good suggestion when we start the visit, instead of saying, what is the matter to you today, try to switch that and say, what matters most to you today? So, and all this discussion really aligns very beautifully with Guy. Um, so the other question is, at least in my clinic, how complex are the patients that I see? And these patients who have dementia comorbidity are heterogeneous. They have different stages of the dementia. They have uh, other comorbid conditions. They have a different functional status, different prognosis. Patients' priorities are definitely uh, diverse. And all we put all this together with the risk of adverse re the, uh, reactions. And in my clinic in particular, we see a lot of dementia in minorities. So all this complexity is definitely a challenge to practitioners. And we need to have this flexible patient center and very dynamic approach. What we do today that could work for someone who has mild dementia, six months down the road, if the patient progresses to moderate dementia in main, the plan needs to be changed. So we need to be very flexible. So here at Grady at the geriatric clinic, we see usually complex and frail patients who had a high burden of cardiovascular comorbidity and multiple health transitions. Usually we see minority patients, mainly African-American, mainly from a very vulnerable population of low income and sometimes also low educational status. And we see different diagnoses, but it's interesting that mixed dementia and vascular dementia are very, very prevalent based on the burden of cardiovascular comorbidities. So when I started working at Grady, the first thing I did, I did a small uh, cross-sectional mixed study and I recruited and interviewed 20 diets of patients living with dementia and their caregivers and other comorbid conditions. And I did a very deep and detailed theoretic assessment. I did a semi-structured qualitative interview, and then I did this analysis to try to see if the plan that we were providing was aligned with the patient's preferences. And mainly just to describe my population, we interviewed 20 patients. The 100% were African-American. The average age of the patients were 78. The average take seven medications and the average have another 3.6 comorbidities besides dementia. Most of the patients had at least four geriatric syndromes besides dementia. And the distribution of the disease of the patients are recruited, 35% have mild dementia, 45 had moderate dementia and 20% have severe dementia. So then we also interviewed the caregivers and interesting 65% of the caregivers were females most were daughters playing the role of the caregivers, and 100% were family and pay caregivers who were taking care of the patients in 65% of the cases, 24 hours. So we asked these patients and the caregivers, what was significant for them? Are we doing what is significant? How can we improve? And what we found is that first, talking about priorities really help. And the caregivers, what they say is that they need more help at home, they need more caregiver education. They need um, more uh, con to consolidate care with the primary cares and to have less providers, to have less fragmented care. And they all requested more caregiver services and more caregiver education. So I gave the, I gave this kind of a quick summary because this I think this that was this research was just before a guide was launched and it really aligned with what we want to accomplish in guide and i'm sure that with guide we'll be able to help these patients and their caregivers as i said before um also referral to adult day care program was really a priority for the patients and this is something that we try to do from church and memory net when we do a social assessment we try to uh, find an, an adult care program that could help both the patient and the families, and it has all these benefits besides decreasing caregiver burden and respite services. And of course, treat the non-behavioral symptoms. The non-behavioral symptoms in my sample were really prominent, and one of the priorities of the, of the patients and the caregivers were that they needed help 
and guidance and education of how to treat these non-cognitive symptoms. So we got guide and we're very happy. And then we have time to discuss guide at other settings. And guide uh, will definitely improve the quality of life of people living with dementia, will definitely reduce the burden and strain of unpaid caregivers like the ones I have from my sample. And the long-term goal is to prevent or delay long-term nursing home admissions. So the model of guide, and I'm sure most of you already saw this slide, but the model is a comprehensive assessment uh, with a care plan with 24 and seven, uh, 24 on seven access to the program with ongoing monitoring and support with a, a very strong part on caregiver support, medication management and care coordination and transition. And of course, a strong uh, link with the community services with referral to different agencies. So these are the, the care delivery requirements and all uh, the programs that we participate in guide will have to address and be sure to, to um, comply with these requirements. And I'm sure that this is going to, what is going to help the caregivers and the families. And this is all these features is go, what is going to help to build a very robust guide program, okay? So as I say before, the main features 24 and seven access, caregiver education tools and assessments, caregiver stress relief strategies, respite services, home visits. This is really important, specifically for our populations who had a, a very high uh, and diverse social needs. I'm sure that the home visits will help a lot and a very strong link with community services. And this is also very important for our program in particular. So the care coordination and the caregiver services, I think is the what is making is going to be making guide different from any other programs and the interdisciplinary care team to deliver these services, not just the memory expert, but the care navigator, the care coordinator, the nurses, the MAs, the nurse practitioners, the whole team with the social workers is and this interdisciplinary approach is what is going to really help the patients. So let me discuss a quick patient and try to see different scenarios. This is a patient from a clinic, 78 year old man who comes and lives with his wife. And the main reason uh, to come and see me uh, were new behavioral symptoms. So for the last two days, the patient started to talk to people on the TV thinking that they were in the room. The wife say in the visit that she was very tired of caring that um, she was really exhausted. The patient had no other symptoms, no fever, no urine symptoms, no cough. His diagnosis, he was diagnosed with mixed dementia seven years ago. At this time, when I saw the patient, he already had moderate to severe dementia. He was dependent in all his instrumental activities of daily living and he was, um, sorry, so was independent on the basics and dependent on all the instrumental activities. He had cognitive tests with a MOCA less than 10 and a SLAMS less than 10. Uh, other comorbidity besides dementia, type two diabetes, gout, hypertension, osteoarthritis and diastolic dysfunction. And the patient was being followed by, followed by multiple providers, endocrinology, cardiology, um, cognitive neurology and geriatrics. He was a complex patient with multiple health transitions. At least he had many uh, emergency department visits and admissions in the last 12 months. So this is one of the patients that we usually see in clinic. This is the complexity of the patients we usually see in a geriatric clinic and in a memory clinic. So uh, this patient presented with a new non-cognitive behavioral symptoms. And we know that these are very stressful for patients and families that they really add to caregiver burden and depression, that they reduce the quality of life of both the patients and the caregiver, that they really increase morbidity, mortality, and most important of all, that is related to polypharmacy, to prescribe more medicines, and to increase nursing home placement. So as you see here in the graph on the left, non-cognitive symptoms in dementia are very, very frequent and based on the stage of the disease, you have different symptoms. In our case, the patient already had moderate to severe dementia, 
And it seems that he presented with some delusions and with some uh, agitation related to seeing these people on TV and talking to these people on TV and thinking that they were in the room. So every time we have a new non-cognitive symptom, of course, at the beginning, we, could, we should rule out acute confusional state or delirium. We could see and see what are the needs, why this patient is presenting with these new symptoms. Is, there, is the patient suffering from untreated and undiagnosed pain? And of course, we want to assess that. And when all this workup is negative, we could assume that the development of these new cognitive symptoms could be the progression of dementia because we know that uh, non-cognitive symptoms, in fact, they are part of the disease. So with the traditional approach, with multiple providers as this patient is having, with difficult, with access care sometimes, even with primary care and with geriatrics, with multiple health transitions and ED evaluation, when a patient like this presents with new cognitive symptoms, most likely if he can't reach the PCP, if he can't reach the geriatric clinic, he will end up in the emergency room and he will have a full workup and he may be admitted to the hospital with all the risks of admitting a patient with dementia to the hospital. But with the guide, hopefully we will accomplish to have coordination of care and the patient will get seen within 24 hours into the guide program. We'll have 24 hours seven access so the family member could call um, a telephone line and speak with a nurse and get, and get advice on the spot on, how to, on what to do with these new behavioral symptoms. We'll be able to provide a lot of caregiver educations on how to manage these non-cognitive symptoms. We'll be able to uh, offer strategies to release caregiver burden and stress. We'll be able to be the link and consolidate care and help the primary care doctors with, the, with these complex patients managing dementia and all this other comorbidity, with the home visits and all the interventions, hopefully we could prevent an admission, prevent an emergency visit, and be able to follow these patients all through all these different visits, all these different settings, and provide advice on the spot. So this is um, the survey of the feedback, but I have another slide that I'm sorry, I, I think I missed this one, but I wanted to show all the programs that we are uh, going to be having guide at the state of Georgia. Uh, we have seven different programs. Um, there is one I program- put, yeah, I did put that in the chat, Dr. Cohen, so people ah, have so a- much. Yeah. So that's excellent. So one of these programs is the Emory Integrated Memory Care. And um, this is an established program. That means that they already started with guide and they started recruiting patients from July 1st. All these other six programs, we have a full year for implementation to think about how to build a very robust program and to incorporate all these uh, requirements and hopefully, in my opinion, to personalize these requirements based on these very specific different populations that we're dealing. And this is kind of the model that we decided to bring at Grady based on the complexity and the social needs of our patients. So in our case, and we can talk about each, we can spend the last uh, 10 minutes talking about how we're going to implement guide in different settings, but at Grady, we're going to build a program based on the services of community health workers uh, and the care coordinator and the social workers. So that would be the main pieces of our program. Of course, the, the memory part, the, we have an NP, but we want to be able to follow these patients with very high health transitions all through the different settings to and provide a lot of caregiver education and stress relief. So now, uh, Ted, if you want, we can open this for discussion with the rest. That sounds great. I know that we have um, some guide participants on and you called out Emory. I know that we have some others as well, but I wanted to give Amy uh, some space right now to talk about, and we're going to test the 24 seven because I'm on call tonight. So we'll see, <laughs> we'll see how that works. But I do, I do get some different calls than my usual call groups. Uh, they're all good and they're all in support of both the patient, but also the family members. Uh, Amy, to you right. to just describe what's going on in uh, Emory Integrated Memory Care. Thanks, Dr. Cohen. I loved the um, title of your presentation, Guiding. It was cute. Um, as I'm sure you live and breathe guide as much as I do. So thanks for that. 
Um, yeah, so we're the only established program in the state of Georgia. We're really lucky is that the integrated memory care, we already had built in a lot of caregiver education support. Um, 20, we already take our own calls. So we have the 24-7 access. Um, what'll be new to us, there's a respite component to this that um, takes a bit of coordination because the, the CMS reimbursement rates are extremely low. Um, but we have seen our first patient. Um, we... You know, in our model, we have, um, I'm a geriatric nurse practitioner, but also acting as the program lead. So we have our nurse practitioner team that's providing care for these patients. Um, we have Liz, our RN, who is designated as our care navigator and kind of the, the gatekeeper, the one that's going to make sure that we're doing everything that we're supposed to be doing and keeping contact with um, patients. We have our social worker. And then on our community side, we have our dementia care assistants that are seeing patients too. So definitely a huge team approach. Um, our, our biggest hurdles right now, and I'm going to say they, you're welcome to all the rest of you is, you know, we're going through all the hurdles of how do we submit that patient? Because it's not taking our tax ID number, but it is our tax ID number. It's a tax ID number on our application and our program ID. So, um, you know, we're, that's our challenges right now is just working through all those kinks, have a brand new program, but we're super excited. I mean, I think Ted, you're exactly right. I think the majority of calls that often we get our caregiver needs. They really just need to, they need validation. Um, they need an explanation of what this medicine is for or something like that, or they're worried about how they gave the medicine. So um, looking forward to, you know, collaborating and coordinating and paving the way and really excited to see the outcomes of this program long-term. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. I know that um, today I received an email about from our hospital and health system leaders going, all right, so how does this money get to us? And how does it get to the respite caregiver? Is this a grant? Should it go through grants operations? And so it, it does take a little bit of level setting. Hey, I was noticing uh, Gary Rasmussen uh, that was on, on the call a second ago. And I know that you represent uh, one of the other guide programs. So I wanted to just in invite you to share information if you're in a in a spot where you can come off mute. Uh, and if I if my list is right, you're with the Appalachian Hospice LLC. Gary? Yes, this is Gary Rasmussen and I have <clears throat> Medea Bragg with me. Um, we are a hospice provider up in North Georgia and you know we're excited to be part of this program. We are a new provider so we have a year to hopefully learn from um, M the Emory Clinic's experience as they go through the process over the next year. And we're excited to be building our program. So we're just kind of getting organized. And um, uh, so we're, we're glad to be able to listen in and you know get some more information as we kind of move forward. Great. You're in the right place and uh, really want to create this as a supportive family to help uh, everybody uh, through this. And I see that uh, Carla is is with us in from Sabio Health. And Carla, if you're in a spot where you can come on and uh, offer some information, that'd be great. Yes, one second. There we go. I'm in my car. So that's what you do in home-based care. You're always in the car trying to figure out where to put your computer and your phone and which headphones you have, but I'm parked. So um, so I'm a geriatrician and palliative medicine physician. We are a new group. As I said in the chat, we provide home-based primary care. Um, you know, I feel like so much of GUIDE is what we already have in our model, but this builds it out and creates more um, hopefully financial sustainability, we shall see, but to really provide families for the care that we as geriatricians or people working with older adults know that is needed. So really excited. Um, I am originally from California and spent my career at UCSF. So working in Georgia is new to me. So I will be very excited to learn from all of you about non-expanded Medicaid and how to get people what they need since I'm so used to services in California. So really thrilled to have this community with all of you. And we're excited to um, you know, serve patients, especially that can't get down down to Emory um, and other in other areas, and to partner with all of you. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Carla, and uh, your your colleagues at UCSF uh, were were letting us know of your arrival, so we're really excited about that. And also noted in your in your chat 
that you were very interested in bilingual care. And so, uh, Gabby, did you want to just say something about some of the things that you're trying to do? Yes. Hi, Carla. I'm, I'm from Argentina, so and I've been working before like for 20 years in a memory clinic. So I have experience with neuropsych tests in Spanish. So I'm trying to right. build. Uh, there are there is a large community of Spanish speaking patients who need memory services, mainly from social memory net to have a diagnosis. And the challenge is to be able to not just do a mocha in Spanish, but to do a full battery in Spanish. So we're trying to build that. So at least here right. at Church of America in Atlanta, the one that is located at Grady, we'll be able to do, you know, we'll try to do a full battery in Spanish. So we are trying to pick up the best test and hopefully uh, be able to replicate and and to do a full assessment. So we're Oh, that's to fantastic. Gabriela, thank you. I look forward to working with you more too. So thank you. Welcome. I wanted to see if there's anyone else representing any of the other seven programs in Georgia. I'll just let you come off a uh, mute and just start talking if 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 you have the opportunity to do so. Um, let's see. I knew I the group from Savannah because we met at Social Internet. They also are a new program to guide. So they, they're probably trying to implement. They have the full one year implementation period. Awesome, awesome. And I know that Savannah also is a linkage between a Georgia memory net memory assessment clinic as well as a guide demonstration. Am I re remembering that correctly? So this is one of those, um, Georgia Memory Net, the memory assessment clinics are a two visit program with a referral from primary care, early accurate diagnosis connection with um, services in the community and then discharge back to primary care. But there's probably a great space for a guide program to be thinking about or partnered with a memory assessment clinic in order to um, think about either assisting or taking over some of the primary care of the patients that, that are seen. Yeah, and this is exactly what's happening at Grady. We have short term memory net, the Atlanta MAC here. And I think this is going to be fantastic because sometimes we don't know, we, we really need longitudinal care, dementia plan once we diagnose them. So it will be aligned and hopefully it will fit nicely with the GMN here. Great. I wanted to point out that the integrated memory care program is both an in-clinic and in-community program. It's a nurse practitioner-led program. I'm proud to be a sponsoring physician for the nurse practitioners that we um, team with. And I wanted to call on my buddy, Allison, and um, ask Allison to maybe talk about some of the social work run services, because I didn't I, I, I didn't see Jen, Jenny on, but we have a newsletter, we have outreach, we have classes, and without saying everything that I hope you'll say, I'll stop there. Yeah, so we're very blessed at the Integrated Memory Care Clinic to have a licensed clinical social worker full -time um, on our team um, who is able to meet with families on an individual basis. She can meet with them in person or via telemedicine. She also coordinates a series of caregiving classes and a monthly support group. All of those are offered virtually via Zoom and or Canvas. She has put together a calendar for the entire year. So we as nurse practitioners, when we're meeting with patients and family care partners are able to give them that calendar for the year so they know to go ahead and plan out their time, what's gonna be offered when. And then yes, we have a weekly newsletter that is delivered via email. That's called the IMC Caregiver Pulse. And that goes out to all of our family care partners to let them know about our offerings, but also let them know about things that we're aware of that are happening in the community, including other support groups, other uh, research opportunities, other ways to support family care partners. Because as Dr. Cohen so eloquently stated early on in our uh, talk today, the stress that care partners are experiencing is significant. Thanks, Allison. There's a couple of questions in the chat about, you know, kind of who pays for what and those sort of things. And so in the, in the kind of bones and structure of guide is recognizing that the comp, the usual compensation model is not appropriate for what we're trying to do with the patients. And I haven't been under the hood enough to see kind of ha how that all works. And so um, I, I, Gabby, I don't know if you had an answer to any of Anna's questions. I can't see. I don't know why I cannot see the chat. What the, can you read the question? Here's, here's uh, Anna Mark's first question. Can Emory IMC Clinic elaborate on how they provide 24-7 coverage? 
That's a call system. Every nurse practitioner and every physician is in that group. And how caregiver education is provided, we just covered that. Is it structured classes? Yes. And ad hoc? Yes. During visits of both. So Anna's later, uh, Anna works a later uh, great question is, does guide pay for the social work visits? Is it something that could be billed to Medicare since the caregiver is not the patient wondering how it gets paid? My understanding, and I'll let other teammates uh, 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 um, Kieran, some of our social work is um, is philanthropic funds. Some of it is kind of an all in payment model. Amy, Allison, do you want to say anything more? Yeah. Go ahead, Amy. So currently, for patients that are not, we really have one patient enrolled. Well, they're not even aligned in guide yet. We've seen them. Can't submit it yet. But um, we have figured out a way. We're building Medicare or insurance for some of those visits. Um, once a, a patient is aligned under the guide model, anything that happens with that dementia care, whether it's um, medical provider, um, co care coordination, whenever it's all included in that dementia care management payment, that's the per member per Bumble. month. So there's no separate, no separate billing for anything dementia related for those patients. Yeah, it's sometimes and for it's our piece. provider. Yeah. As a membership to a fitness center. You, you're paid where you go, you don't go, you do use it, you don't use it. A mental fitness center. Hey, I wanted to thank everybody for a great session today. Really appreciate it. We, we hit 39 people, so we're really proud of that. And we hope that you'll stay in touch. We have Georgia Memory Insights each and every month. We have a number of services that we'd love to have you connected. So thanks for signing up today. We'll send you some emails back. I'm very interested in trying to get the Georgia Guide programs together. I hope that you are as well, because I think there's a lot of information sharing as we ramp up, this is an eight year journey and um, lots of things that we can share information about how each of these things worked for any one of us. So thanks everybody, have a great day. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you, bye-bye.